Uh, Hebrews chapter number 4, if you find your place there, Hebrews chapter number 4, and I encourage you to find your spot there. Appreciate you being here this morning. I'm looking forward to this message. I already enjoyed the service and worshiping our Lord, singing songs of worship and praise. As I've said before, I am with all my heart looking forward to the day that we're all back together and uh, can meet here in this auditorium, praying that it's sooner than later, disappointed that uh, it has been extended in some sense, uh, the quarantine and so forth, that the, the majority of the reason I, I'm disappointed is because I was hoping I'd get rid of my COVID-19 beard, and uh, I was planning on shaving it when it's all over, and it's still going and ongoing, so I apologize for this, okay? Uh, many of you have been giving me such a hard time, and uh, <laughs> via text message, thanks, so it's on for a few more weeks, apparently, and it's catching a little bit. Some of you have sent in texts saying, Pastor Tony needs to get with the program, and uh, get one too. Mr. Quick did, it looked like, so hey, why not Pastor Tony too, huh? But nonetheless, I'm sorry to put you through but uh, you've been a little cruel. Somebody this morning told me it's an improvement. I don't know how to take that, Brother Brad, but anyway, uh, nonetheless, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're tuning in, and we are excited to be worshiping together and uh, thankful that you have joined us one way or the other. The title of this morning's message is simply this. You see it up behind me. It's troubled but always triumphant. Troubled but always triumphant. I think it is a fitting title for what we are experiencing even today and what we are going through. One of the most endearing and encouraging truths found in the New Testament is an often overlooked reality, or at least it's very underappreciated. You say, why is that, Pastor Henry, Uh, even before you tell us what that truth is? Well, uh, part of the reason, or probably the biggest reason why it is underappreciated and overlooked is the simple reality that it's hard to fathom. It's difficult in our finite minds to wrap our minds around uh, this greatly encompassing truth, if we might put it that way. In other words, it's hard for us to understand how is that possible? What the Bible says, how is that even uh, possible? How can that be? In fact, we have a big theological term to describe it. And uh, you've probably heard it before. I've said it in reference. It's the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. Oh, my goodness, what does that mean, right? The hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. It's very simple. You could honestly probably uh, know what it is without knowing the term. Terms are very unimportant at times. So what does it mean? Well, here's a basic definition. So we understand it, and, and you'll understand. Oh, yeah, I know what that is after you see it. The hypostatic union describes how God the Son, Jesus Christ, took on a human nature yet remained fully God at the same time, maintaining what we might call or describe as a God nature. Jesus always has been God. He will forever be God. But in the incarnation, Jesus became a human being taking on a human nature. The addition of the human nature to the divine nature produced for us Jesus Christ, God-man. And it's the hypostatic union, Jesus Christ, one person, fully God and fully man at the same time. Now, you say, that's great, that's a good definition, it's an important truth. But it's not a term that we throw around all the time. We don't go around talking about the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ, okay, in our common conversation. However, though it may not be a term we use often, it is greatly important nonetheless. Because it display, or excuse me, because it explains and shows how God, Jesus Christ, displayed divine characteristics such as uh, the miracles, his, his uh, omnipotence, his power, his omniscience, and so forth, as he was able to do things that were obviously non-human. These are things that none of us can, can do and so forth, and he displayed the character, the nature of God, while at the same time, he demonstrated or showed, exhibited the character characteristics of humanity. He wept. He was hungry. He got tired. He got worn out. He, dis- he displayed that he is 100% human at the same time. So the encouraging part about that, really the endearing part of such a theological truth is that last part. Jesus Christ was 100% human, and as I like to put it, and in that, don't miss it this morning, he was just like you and me. 
He was just like us. And sometimes we look at Christ, and yes, he is divine. He is God, 100% God, and amazing in his omniscience, omnipotence, and his even omnipresence in some ways, and able, able to appear at different times, go through a crowd without them realizing. I mean, it's pretty amazing. He is 100% God. But I want to tell you this morning, and we want to focus this morning on the 100% humanity of Jesus Christ. He was just like you and me in many ways. And that ought to encourage us. That ought to endear him to us in many ways. Paul understood it. He understood the impact and the, uh, the encouragement that this truth presents to us when he wrote about it in Hebrews chapter 4. Look with me at verse 15, if you will. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15. For we have not an high priest, a reference certainly to Jesus Christ. He's been spending much of the book already describing Christ and certainly as our high priest. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And when we put our infirmities there, okay, we're not talking about necessarily, oh, uh, I, my, my knee hurts today, okay? Um, I've reached a point in old age that uh, we're uh, just sitting for a long time trying to get up afterwards hurts, right? Okay? And joints and things don't work like they used to and so I got up after Sunday school and Jim was starting to pray and like my knee about gave out I'm like this is not fun and getting old is for the birds right and so we under that's not what it's talking about all those infirmities what it's talking literally about he is touched with the feeling of our humanity Everything that goes with that, and that, that entails the fact that uh, certainly that may encompass those kind of infirmities, but the reality is it is a much broader scope, a greater umbrella enveloping and encompassing everything that is us that we experience because we are human. So he's touched by that. Notice it. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. We probably studied this verse en enough to know that that word translated as he was tempted is a Greek word literally meaning trials. A test is really when you look it up and one of the first definitions, it's just a test. It's a testing. May I submit to you that we all are well aware that life can often be described as being full of tests and trials. Just constantly, they're there. They're always confronting us. They're always uh, appearing there. In fact, it sometimes see, it seems that life is nothing but tests and trials. For many of us, it seems like we have them right after another, some on top of each other. It's just full. It's nothing but tests and trials. And certainly, may I just submit to you this morning, there's no doubt that this is a trial, a test. Whether you want to describe it of our faith or our, our conviction, our devotion, our commitment, uh, how we will handle things being removed and taken away. Hey, listen, my friend, this is a test. This is a trial. Life is full of them. It just may be bigger in its scope. It may be bigger in its application or influence. It's a test. It's a trial. And boy, yes, Christ faced them. You and I faced them. Life is full of them. And yet Paul is making a great point here. That offers us great encouragement. I'll just tell you, this encourages my heart when we contemplate what he was saying. When Jesus Christ was like us, when he walked this earth, and in possession of that human nature, he was happy, he was excited, he was sorrowful, he was disappointed, he was even troubled. He was even troubled at times. Jesus Christ, 100% God, 100% human, had experiences and tests and trials in which he found himself, in which his heart was troubled. Truth be told this morning, I would venture to guess that many of us are troubled in one way or another through this trial. At some point along the way, if not this morning, as you and I sit here, as we're watching via live streaming, whatever the case may be, there is a good reality and a possibility that we have been troubled, if not troubled right now, in our hearts and our spirit. We've all been affected, as we've said in many times in several messages now, we've, we've all been affected in different ways, and yet the common thread is this. We are all affected. All of us are. We have people who have lost their jobs, those who have been laid off without receiving a penny, Seniors in high school whose last year of school came to a screeching halt. We've had family members who've had to say goodbye to loved ones via a phone, not even able to attend a funeral. Many who've missed out on things looked forward to and anticipated. Others forced to do things they would never imagine they would do. And many face an uncertain future staring them down in many areas of their lives. 
Can I just submit to you this morning that indeed it is a troubling time. But we can never say that Jesus Christ never had troubling times. We can never say, hey, Christ never faced it. He did. He was 100% human. And though the, uh, the, the, the size of the trial, the size of the test may differ like it does in our lives, the fact is this, Jesus Christ faced troubling times. And I would submit, I dare say, that none of us have faced the trial like Christ faced at the end of his life. So it is no doubt troubling times. But I would submit to you this morning, it is a troubling time right now. I would not belittle what's going on in our hearts and our soul and our spirit. And, and I want to encourage you today, that is somewhat the thrust of the message. Yes, we are troubled today. And as a Christian, it is okay to be troubled at times. We have this misnomer, this misconception that well, a perfect Christian is never bothered in their spirit. Well, that's not true. We'll see today that Jesus Christ was troubled. In fact, one of such passages is in John chapter 11. You remember it? We are faced in John chapter 11 with Mary. Mary of the Mary, Martha, and Lazarus fame. And good friends with Jesus Christ, well known to them. He spent time in their house. And in John chapter 11, Jesus Christ is coming to their house. And he has already heard that Lazarus was sick. And then Lazarus died. And here comes Mary and throws herself down at Jesus' feet. And as she does, she's weeping, she's carrying on about Lazarus dying, and she just utters a very heart-cutting statement, doesn't she? You remember what she said? She said this, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now, we've seen that in other messages, I believe, and we would look at that statement, a lack of faith, and certainly a, a misunderstanding. Maybe emotions and feelings were talking, and she forgot who Jesus Christ was, and yet she kind of follows that up with some good statements. But here's the point, nonetheless. Jesus Christ is coming. His Lazarus, his friend, has died. He, he sees Mary. He sees the other Jews weeping. And you know what the Bible describes for us in this? Here's his heart. He is touched. He is full of compassion. His human nature is no doubt disappointed, maybe even hurt by that statement, and yet it is at the same time moved. And the Bible says that he is troubled. This was not an easy time. This was not a, a peaceful time. Literally, the verse says this, verse 33. When Jesus therefore, uh, excuse me, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Man, that's a statement, isn't it? Wait a minute, this is God. This is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He groaned in his spirit. He, he was troubled, literally, in his spirit. Yes, that's what it says. I, I, I would surmise that there have been at least a few of us, if not many of us, that have groaned in the spirit this past month. That, that over this ordeal, this test, the trial, uh, the, the upheaval of life, the things that have challenged us because of it, we have been troubled. I, I know for a fact, certainly there have been a fair amount of tears shed by many different folks by the troubles that have come upon us during this time. Uh, may I submit to you this? I don't know what groaning in the Spirit sounds like, but I sure do know what it feels like. There's not one of us that hasn't been touched. As a pastor, I, I, this whole ordeal is, there's no textbook for how to handle it. There, there's nothing written, even in scriptures, of, okay, this is how you handle this situation, other than basic principles by which to live. I'm telling you, this is difficult. This is difficult as a father, a husband, a pastor. It's difficult as a Michigander. It's difficult as a citizen of the United States of America. So it, it's difficult. We're here. We're facing it. And the reality is there are times when we're groaning in our spirit. Now, maybe if your husband, your wife may know what groaning in spirit sounds like because <laughs> she's the only one you groan to. But we're troubled. Christ was troubled. He understood what groaning in the spirit was because of things that are going on, trials and testing. And yet, what did Paul say in Hebrews 4? And yet he sinned not. Man, I love that statement. He's troubled, groaning in his spirit. Whether because of their lack of faith, their unbelief, whatever the case may be, this was a trial, a, a testing time, if we may put it this way. It happened in many other occasions, certainly some that aren't uh, referred to or recorded for us in scriptures, but another one happened in John chapter 13. 
It was in the upper room. Jesus Christ had just completed washing the feet of the disciples. In doing so, he had talked about, okay, these things are going to happen, and they are going to be the proof that I am the Messiah. I am the Savior of the world. And he inserts a statement there that one of them is going to betray him. Now, I'll tell you, I, I just imagine up to that point, certainly they were taken aback by the washing of their own feet by Jesus Christ, their leader. Uh, <laughs> but... I think everything just changed, the tone, the demeanor of everyone when Christ uttered that statement. One of you is going to betray me. I'm sure a hush fell over the room. I'm sure even Peter stopped talking. And everybody just fearful, alarmed, angry glances looking around. And very much, no doubt, they became like Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, notice what the verse says, John 13, verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, speaking to them what was going to happen, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. So now here's his troubled heart. And boy, he's bothered and, and he's He's troubled in his spirit, and now he shares with them what's been troubling his spirit. And I can assure you right there in that moment, those disciples became troubled in their spirit too. You think they wanted to hear that Jesus Christ was going to be betrayed? Yea, be betrayed by one of them. This is, this is, this is troubling. This is bothersome. This is means for groaning in the spirit. He was troubled in his spirit. May I ask you just a personal question this morning? As you sit here or as you watch there at home and sit at home, are you troubled in your spirit? Are there some things going on in your life, maybe certainly because of COVID-19 or because of some other things in life, you're sitting there with a troubled spirit? Now, I want to make a statement this morning, and I want you to understand it is meant to be a word of encouragement. If you're sitting there with a troubled spirit this morning, I don't want you to think that you are a bad Christian for having a troubled spirit. I, I, don't, I don't want you to think that you are less of a believer because your spirit has been troubled over this. And I would submit to you, neither does God. A troubled spirit certainly is not equated to sin. Frankly, I think it would be a very rare person who has not had a troubled spirit through this ordeal. If that's you, my friend, I, that's fantastic, but let me encourage you about this. You probably know someone who has a troubled spirit. Someone's called you. Someone's communicated with you. Someone has, has contacted you via social media. Somebody has expressed their troubled spirit, and you know it. You see, I want you to be encouraged that if you have had now or if you have had a troubled spirit at times during this trial, you know what it simply proves? You are human like Jesus Christ. You are human like Jesus Christ. We don't, man, sometimes we hold up this facade of a, of a perfect Christian, a, one who's never bothered, and, and boy, everything's just perfect. My, my friend, as a believer, may I just submit to you, it is possible to be troubled in your spirit and at the same time seeing it as well with my soul. Because it is. My soul is in his hands. There's no doubt. But all of us face things in life that are trialsome and troublesome. There are tra tests and trials that come up that, boy, they just burden our spirit. There is no doubt of that. So let's be careful when we think about going through these things that, boy, if I don't just put on a, a happy face and everything's perfect in my life and no one has to know. When they ask me, how are you doing? Perfectly fine. You know what? Sometimes it ought to be okay for you and I to say, well, I'm troubled in my spirit. But praise be to God, he provides comfort and help in a moment of need. He provides what you and I need when our spirit is troubled. And may I just say, he does it through the Holy Spirit, he does it through God's Word, he does it through God's house, and he does it through God's people. He, he wants to provide the help. We'll see that here in this message this morning. But would you just admit, would you be open and transparent this morning? Would you just understand that it is human? To be troubled in your spirit at times? Now, is it not enough proof? Well, you name for me, please, the top in your head. Don't do it out loud. Name for me the top five Christians. If you had to say, hey, here's the top five Christians in the New Testament. Believers that are presented to us in the New Testament, here they are. I would just venture a guess that for the overwhelming majority of us, we would find Paul somewhere in there. 
Timothy, having written most of the New Testament, we have a unique glimpse into his life and what he faced and so forth. What's interesting about that is he's one of my favorite authors. I think that's why we like him so much in the letters that I write. Because you know why? He is very transparent in revealing his own humanity. He shows and displays things about himself like, man, I would never say that about myself. <laughs> I would never do that. And yet he does. He is transparent in some wonderful ways. And boy, that's encouraging. Look with me, if you will, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I think this is just a, a unique passage we find in the second letter to the church of Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. We're going to look at verse number 13, if you will, with me. Okay? So, hey, be of good courage. If you're a troubled spirit right now, and there, oh boy, things have been difficult, and boy, you're just oh, troubled, hey, be of good courage. Just proves you're human. But let's look to Paul. Let's understand what he went through. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, and look with me at verse 13. He said this, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Let's get some background here. So here's Paul. Paul has written the first letter to the church at Corinth. And my friend, boy, if you've read 1 Corinthians, you find out quickly it's a hard letter. It's a harsh and direct letter to a church that really needed it. They were spiritually struggling. In fact, they needed him and his, his guiding hand in words. They were in dire straits spiritually. In fact, they were probably a church in modern description. They were probably headed for split. They were probably headed for being no more there or a testimony in their locale and their location. They were in great need. And so he was just greatly burdened. And so he writes off this, this first letter, 1 Corinthians, to the church of Corinth. And boy, he deals with sin. He confronts. He deals with schisms within the body. Boy, he just deals with everything. Misappropriation of the communion, the Lord's Supper. I mean, he just goes through it all in the first letter. Well, you and I both know, boy, if you've said something or written something that, that had to be written, that was straight and direct and straightforward, boy, sometimes uh, you're not sure how that could be taken. And here he was being so burdened for the church, the believers there. So much so that he sent Titus. He sent Titus there. He said, listen, Titus, I need you to go check. I need you to go look at, see how things are going. How was the letter received? Has, has the Holy Spirit and the Lord been able to use it and work in people's hearts and lives? What was going on there? So he sent Titus to check on them, certainly to encourage them to help them along the way. And now... Uh, he was looking forward to their paths crossing in Troas. Here was he was going to give his report. He hadn't heard much from the church of Corinth, and so this was going to be uh, kind of alleviation to his concern, his burden, maybe even a little trouble about the church at Corinth. What we see here, he arrives there, and what does the verse say? He doesn't find Titus. Titus not there. For whatever reason, we don't know what it is, he doesn't find Titus. And boy, how does it describe him? He was troubled in his spirit. You say, well, Pastor Andy, it doesn't say that. Well, yeah, it does. It says his spirit had no rest. What's interesting about that, the word for rest literally means an alleviation of troubles, <laughs> of trials, of adversity. Uh, uh, if you put it this way, it's a, to be free from persecutions or tribulation. That's literally what it means. Paul didn't have that. He, he wasn't having rest in his spirit. I sure am thankful that there are times, though limited, where we have rest in our spirit. Where, where there isn't a trial or tribulation or something happening. God gives us a little bit of a respite, a break spiritually. I mean, I'm thankful for that. Because life could easily just be full of tests and trials. And yet our God is gracious at times to give us a little respite. But that was not the case for Paul here. He didn't sense that. In fact, his, he was worked up, if we could put it that way. He was troubled, as many of us are, are today. And may I just submit again that I ought to be encouraging to you. One of the greatest Christians of the New Testament. He doesn't meet Titus. We're not necessarily talking about a spiritual thing here. He, he doesn't see his good friend Titus. He doesn't get a report about the church. He is troubled in the spirit. Now, my friend, you may have lost your job, and, and you're saying, how am I going to put food on the plate? How am I going to handle this? Boy, a loved one's sick, and I can't go to them, and you're troubled in your spirit. Don't let the devil or someone else make you think you are less of a Christian for being troubled in your spirit. That's not true. Christians can be troubled in their spirit. The question is, what do you do with it? How do you handle it? How do you respond to it? Here is Paul, and this is a grand and a great encouragement to us. 
what you have felt, the, the upheaval, not only in life, but your very spirit. It happened to Christ. It happened to Paul. And most assuredly, it has happened to pretty much every believer that has ever graced this clod of dirt we call earth. You see, don't equate being troubled with defeat, failure, spiritual inadequacy, or somehow being less than what you should be. Would you just take that to heart? Brother Jim alluded to false doctrine. I wouldn't call it a false doctrine, but I'll tell you, I think it's some bad beliefs when we think that all of us have to be this perfect thing, that nothing ever troubles us in our spirit, that nothing, my friend, that is not being human. But we have a high priest who is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Why? Because he experienced the same. And God forbid that you and I ever look down on ourselves and note it. We ever look down on someone else for being troubled in their spirit. Thinking less of them spiritually. Condemning them in one way or the other and, and saying, oh, you're just not as spiritual because you're troubled in your spirit. Can I tell you, if you're not troubled in your spirit, I might have to question your humanity. Because life is full of tests and trials. It's full of things that sometimes ought to trouble us in our spirit. Because you know what troubles do? They drive us to the one who has all the answers. Tests and trials drive us to God. See, the only way a troubled spirit becomes sin is allowing it to affect our faith and actions in a negative way. Please hear this. If it causes you and I, our troubled spirit, if it causes us to drift away from God, if it causes us to drift away from God's house and God's people, if it causes us to loosen our ropes of faith that keep us anchored to Jesus Christ, then we have to admit we have gone where Jesus Christ didn't go with it. We have gone where Paul didn't go with it. And we have gone where God never intended us to go with it. There, it certainly affects our faith. There, it certainly then becomes a matter of lack of faith. But to be troubled is to be human, just as Christ. One of the great proofs of the hypostatic union is the reality that Jesus Christ wept, that Jesus Christ was weary, that he was tired, that Jesus Christ was even troubled in his spirit. It's a great truth that one that ought to just encourage us this morning. But at the same time, may I just encourage you about this? It is both interesting and crucial about these times of experiencing a troubled spirit that they can be what we might call life-defining moments. See, I like this. I, I said, uh, boy, I, I am praying that God uses COVID-19 and, and this trial, this tribulation right now to work in our life. Each life has life-defining moments, as we might speak of it. Uh, Brother Jim alluded to sports this morning. So sports, we speak of these life-defining moments regularly. These moments where a player, an athlete, is confronted with a situation that demands decision-making that sets one on a certain path or continues one down a path. And it's often found, and don't miss this, these life-defining moments are often found in response of a person to adverse or difficult situations. So how does an athlete respond to an injury? How does an athlete being, uh, respond to being thrust into the limelight at a, at a crucial moment because of someone else's injury, however you want to describe it? That, these can become life-defining moments. Listen, my friend, um, there's, a, there's a thing out there, and forgive me if I offend you by this. Um, someone had sent out an Astrodomus, um, uh, a prognostication about the, the COVID-19. It's funny because even some Christians were throwing it around, and what they did not realize that it was completely made up. Somebody reworded one his things and even alluding to China and so forth. Listen, if you could have prognosticated, if you could have prophesied that COVID-19 was going to happen, I think you would have been one alone. That it blew up like this. Like it has become what it is. I don't think anybody said this. I don't think anybody said that this is coming down the pike. And yet, here we are, and may I say as a Christian, listen to me, don't mess it. This can be very well a life-defining moment for you. You're troubled, it's okay to be troubled. That's human. But your response is everything. 
how you handle adversity and how you handle a difficult situation, how you handle this thing that you are confronted with. And I'll tell you, boy, sports is a great illustration of it in some ways. We have um, many illustrations. Take, take Tom Brady, for instance, a, a graduate of the University of Michigan. Sorry, MSU fans. He's a little spoken of, what, sixth-round draft pick. I mean, he's a nobody, almost Mr. Irrelevant, if you know about that. I mean, literally, he's at the end. He's a nobody. He sits on the bench. Then all of a sudden, 2001, in week two game of, of the NFL season, in the fourth quarter, this first-string quarterback, Drew Bledsoe, makes a run out to the sideline, and here comes Mo Lewis of the, uh, of the Jets, New York Jets, and waylays Drew Bledsoe. Hurts his, it hurts him in his core, lung, and so forth. And all of a sudden, this unknown guy named Tom Brady walks on the field. And the rest is history. A dynasty begins. Man, you talk about a life-defining moment? Listen, sports, unimportant. Many of us have found that out during this time. But it is a great picture of when something happens and our response to that. What if Tom Brady referred or responded to his coach, Bella, Bella Cheater, I mean Belichick, um, came over and he said, Tom Brady, time to go in. What if Tom says, nah, I don't think so. I'm scared. <laughs> I don't feel like it. I don't want to do that. Nah, not this time, coach. What would have changed? It would have been a lot better for my Indianapolis Colts, I'll tell you that. Uh, but, what, man, so many things would have changed. Can I tell you how you respond right now to a troubled spirit? will be a life-defining moment, much greater than a dumb sport and an athlete in those situations. But we often think of those things, and it's a minute illustration of what is important for you and I. See, here's a great truth. Man, I love this. See, every one of us are faced when encountered with the troubling of our spirit, life-defining moments, the choices that go along with them. What was Paul faced with? Now, don't miss this. Paul comes to Troas, and you ever have great expectations? I can't imagine being a senior in high school now, playing a spring sport, or this was your last year to play, and boy, your graduation and everything, and all that with being a senior, and all the fun, and boy, those things are just ripped away, and some of our uh, students here at FBA, and their sports season ripped away, and just things you're looking forward to, kindergarten, I mean, there's just so many things that have changed and been ripped away. You have a choice in how to respond to these things. Some of you, boy, you'd love to go to work, and you can't. That's been taken from you. See, Paul had choices like you and I did, troubled in his spirit. He gets to Troas. Titus isn't there. You know what Paul could have done? He could have gone in his room, pulled the covers up, and said, I'm not facing the world. He could have. That's a human response. He, he could have said, I'm throwing in the towel. I'm done with this. I, I, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want, I, this is ridiculous. And boy, just, just respond away. He, he could have, if I could describe it this way, he could have literally allowed the troubled spirit to derail him to distract him from those things which are important. He could have allowed it, don't miss it, to cause him to be detached from his God in his ministry. These are all viable options, humanly speaking. And boy, we've seen people do that. Distracted, detached, derailed. But he didn't. How did he respond? Look at verse 12 with me, if you will. Notice verse 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and the door was open unto me of the Lord, and it goes on the verse of the day, I had no rest of my spirit because Titus wasn't there. But I want you to see something that he says. I, I, I know it comes before verse 13, but he's describing his time in Troas. He comes there. He has uh, a task to do, and he doesn't find Titus, but what does he find? He says this, he found an open door. Man, he found an open door. And what was the task that he was going to do in the open door? Well, I like how he puts it here, to preach Christ's gospel. What do we know gospel means? Good news. Christ's good news. The good news of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, who died for the sins of every person. May I tell you, if you're watching today via live stream, if you're here this morning with us, and the fact is this, that you are not saved, you don't know you're going to heaven, may I tell you right now, COVID-19 is an open door for me to preach to you that Jesus Christ can save you. That he can give you heaven, help you gain heaven, and lose hell through what he did on the cross of Calvary. This is an open door. 
here was Paul, and boy, he could have he could have packed it in. He could have responded in his troubled spirit in a way that didn't take advantage of this. He found the field white unto harvest. Hearts were open and tender. The Holy Spirit had gone before him, preparing hearts of the people. And may I put it this way? Here's the truth. Even while his spirit was heavy and troubled, Paul kept on keeping on. And he kept on. There is no doubt in my mind that many of us have had an open door open to us through a troubling time. I enjoy so much getting text messages, emails, phone calls, meeting people here during the before and after the service who tell me, you know, I had a coworker just start asking me, a coworker before just walked away from me when I tried to talk to him about Christ. But now they're listening. They came and asked me questions. May I tell you what that is? That's an open door. And you know what can distract us and derail us and and get us detached from doing what God wants us to do? A troubled spirit. It's human. It's It's okay to have a troubled spirit, but do not let it keep you from keeping on. Paul gives us a great illustration of this truth. He was faithful even with a troubled spirit. In many ways for each of us, life has come to a screeching halt. Don't miss it. Christian, though that may be true, the duty and calling of a Christian never ceases. It never stops. Paul realized it. I encourage you this morning, you may have a troubled spirit. I get it. I understand it. I, too, at times through this have had a troubled spirit. But even in spite of that, shine brightly for Christ. Bring him glory in all you do. Show Christ to anyone you can. Encourage the brethren. Provoke other believers unto good works. Comfort the hurting. Rejoice with those that rejoice. Mourn with those that mourn. Love your neighbor. We can do those things. Even with a troubled spirit. Yea, honestly, the Bible says in our weakness, his strength is shown. And so it is true. Keep on keeping on. I love Paul because he's an inspiration to us here because he keeps on keeping on. He is faithful. You know what we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2? I love this because he's now living out what he had told the church at Corinth to do. He's living out what he wrote to them just a letter before. Therefore, my uh, my beloved, uh, as he says here in, in, in 1 Corinthians, notice it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. He wrote that, the last part of his letter to them before. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, he faces it, man. This is, this is an obstacle. This is a troubled spirit. This is not at all the way life was supposed to go right now. He was supposed to find Titus. He's supposed to hear about the church of Corinth. That didn't happen. And you know what he's demonstrating? What I wrote to you, what I told you, what I, what I instructed you, I am now doing. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. He is literally living out what he said. Do you realize? Sometimes I think we lose sight of this simple truth. Do you realize that there are crowns in heaven awaiting believers simply for our faithfulness? Just be faithful. And God has promised crowns. Crowns in heaven. Yes, to cast back at his feet, but there are crowns for being faithful. If you are nothing else but faithful in living for God, serving him, come what may, you are a successful believer. You may be troubled in spirit, but you can keep on keeping on. You may be disappointed and discouraged about some things, but you can keep on keeping on. In many ways, That is the life of an overcomer that we heard about in Sunday school. You can do it. Now, there's a second truth here that is just as important. It's certainly one that ties into Sunday school. Would you note it? Here's a truth. His spirit, speaking of uh, Paul, his spirit was troubled, but his mind and heart were full of gratitude. This is amazing because look at verse number 14, if you will, with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. He says this, after talking about his spirit, not having rest, not finding Titus, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to, what's the next word? Triumph. 
Man, there's victory. There's triumph here. Always causes us to triumph in Christ. It maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. I love this. We get a glimpse into the mind and heart of Paul being full of gratitude. He knew what? That in all things, we as God's children, as followers of Jesus Christ, are truly more than conquerors. No troubled spirit, and do not miss it, no troubled spirit to Paul could be or would be the end of him. It would not sideline him. It would not stop him from keeping on, keeping on. It's not going to slow him in doing what he was doing. Rather, he's going to turn his eyes, his thoughts, his focus on what I like to call the truth of triumph he possessed because he was where? In Christ. And boy, isn't that key? Jim alluded to it in Sunday school. My friend, if you're listening today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will know nothing but defeat and nothing of triumph or victory in life unless you come to know Jesus Christ. We sing a hymn. It's called Victory in Jesus, my friend. There is no hymn that can be sung or a song to be sung that there is victory without Jesus Christ. It's not there. There's no, no, no triumph without Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul finds. Hey, in Christ, I can be a triumphant. Even though I have a troubled spirit, did things play out the way that Paul wanted? No. Titus wasn't there. He had no idea what Corinth was doing. He had no idea if they'd read his letter and burned it, threw it away. They had no idea. His heart's burdened for them. It certainly did not play out the way that he desired. And yet, here he is. He says, I'm, thanks be unto God, because I'm going to triumph in Christ. See, it's a choice we all have in these life-defining moments of life. Paul knew them well. And he continued to turn his thoughts and focus on the truth of triumph he possessed because he was in Christ. I like what Paul goes on to write. Look at verse 15. Notice it. He says this, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that are perished. He goes on to expand upon it. But notice what he says. Here's the statement. When we embrace this triumphant truth, we are a sweet savor of Christ to God. And I like that. You know what I want God to think of when he thinks of Stephen Henry? A sweet savor of Christ. There's someone who's living out the victory, the triumph they have in Christ. If God is all that he should be to you, your number one goal should be to please God. Did you catch that, Christian? If God is who the Bible says he is and who we profess him to be, then our lives and our, our minds should be directed towards pleasing God in all things. And that includes, man, through this situation, I want to be a sweet savor unto God. And what does it say? A sweet savor of Christ. I like that. There's some other definite a fragrance of that, okay? Um, boy, uh, cologne and everything else, okay? Um, you think of that. You're, you're, you're masking your own smell. You're smelling like someone else. What if, what if they've started putting out bottles? Oh, you can smell like so-and-so, okay? For instance, I'll pick on Dave Cooper. Let's say this, okay? Hey, look, and you can buy this cologne, and it smells like Dave Cooper. Whoever wants to do that, yeah. Um, maybe uh, Val would buy many of them or not. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> you can sm smell like Dave Cooper, okay? And you want to smell like, oh, yeah, I want to smell like that. You know what? Y you say that's silly. Well, it really isn't because sometimes you know who they put on advertisements to sell cologne or perfume? Some famous person. Oh, they wear that. I want to wear that, okay? So Dave Cooper's famous, okay? Huh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so you want to smell like that? Hey, I want to. Listen, you know what the Christian life is? Paul says, listen, I, I want to smell, be a sweet savor of Christ. And here's what's neat. Did you catch it? It wasn't just unto God, but it was also unto believers, fellow Christians, and even unto those that perish, he wrote, unbelievers. So through this trial, though I'm troubled in spirit, I want to be a sweet savor of Christ unto God, unto my fellow believers, and unto the unsaved. Man, what a great goal for this present trial. This, this test that we find ourselves coming face to face with. I don't know about you, but I want to be that during this trial. I want to be a sweet savor unto God of Christ, unto others of Christ, unto those who are unsaved, to be a sweet savor of him. You say, well, that's all good and, and great, Pastor Henry, but how can I, with a troubled spirit, 
live that triumphant life? How, how, how can I be that sweet savor to God and others? Sure, I'm glad you asked. Turn back with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter number 4. We'll finish up with the passage we started with. Hebrews chapter number 4. And let's look again, if you will, verse number 15. Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 15. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now notice this, verse 16. What does he say? Let us therefore, based on this hypostatic union, the rally of Christ being troubled in spirit at times, and that let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need man what a great promise you and i can handle the troubled spirit in the face of a challenging trial through the mercy and grace we receive from the hand of god in response to our prayers for it did you catch what ta- what paul said don't miss this paul says in your time of need you know what a troubled spirit often reveals a time of need a, a time of tr- a troubled spirit says wow i can't handle this this is not going the way i wanted boy i need God. And I, I need what he has to offer. Put it this way, and I think I put it up here on the uh, thing. Paul said, in our time of need, we can come boldly before the throne of God. We can find the help that we need to live that triumphant life. We can receive the grace and mercy to keep on keeping on with a troubled spirit. That grace and mercy needed to keep our eyes and our thoughts focused on the truth of triumph we have in Christ throughout the trial. That's what we can do. I can come, okay, God, I'm coming before your throne boldly because Jesus Christ is my high priest. He is touched by my infirmities, the feeling of my infirmities. And man, you know what? He knows what I'm talking about. And this is a time of need. Yesterday afternoon, I was down in the basement studying and, and uh, uh, working towards today. And, and little Ryan comes down, and I can tell when he's coming down. And, and often it begins with, da-da, da-da. <laughs> and he comes down the stairs, and I hear his little pitter patter And he turns the corner, and he comes to me as I'm sitting at my desk in front of my computer. He goes, come, come, come. Just like that. And uh, we use very m- few words, okay? We try not to waste words in our house. Come, come, come. Like, I mean, intense he is. Boy, he's just, uh, come, come, come. You know, like this. And, and I'm sorry, I have a soft spot for my son. And uh, so I get up. Uh, okay, okay, hang on, hang on. And I start going up the stairs behind him. I follow him. He's climbing as best as he can those stairs. We get up to the top, and then he decides I'm not going quick enough, so he grabs my, my pant leg. He pulls me all the way around the island in our kitchen. He stops in front of the counter, and he goes, hmm, I'm done. I go, what are you talking about? And sure enough, the most important thing in his life right there was a thing of candy. (laughs) I mean, I talk about intensity, man. This guy wanted the candy. He was, it was his time of need. And my friend, he couldn't reach it. He needed help. Is this your time of need, Christian? Thank you, Caden. Are you troubled? In your spirit. What's knocked you sideways? Is it loss of a job? Is it uh, something that has transpired or come from this situation? Why are you troubled in your spirit? And yea, it may just simply be, boy, life is just turned upside down. May I tell you, listen, there is mercy and grace from your God to be triumphant. It's ready. Come boldly. And here's the icing on the cake. God, you don't know what this feels like. You don't understand what I'm going through. And I, but Barry, it's terrible. It's hard. I, I don't know if I can keep going on. And God, I just need mercy and grace. No way. You know what you go to? God, you know exactly what I'm going through. Jesus Christ, you've experienced this. You know what it is to be troubled in my spirit. And, and boy, it may seem to be others to be a little thing. And yet Jesus Christ knows exactly what your spirit is going through. And man, I'll tell you what, I sure like going to a doctor who knows his business. I like much more going to a God who knows what I'm going through. He's experienced it. He's endured it. Yea, better, he's overcome it. He's been triumphant. And so God today says this, Christian, I know you're troubled, but you can still be triumphant. How? 
How does that happen? Well, it really leaves us with our takeaways, doesn't it? Three things I'd encourage as we go into this invitation. Three ways to pray. Three things to pray for specifically. And I'd encourage you to do it as we go into this invitation. Number one, pray for God to continue to encourage you with the comfort of knowing that Jesus, that Christ is your compatriot in dealing with your troubled heart. It is a good to know you are not alone. That Jesus Christ has experienced what you're experiencing right now. The God in heaven knows exactly what a troubled spirit feels like. And I'll tell you, I, I love going to a doctor who says, oh yeah, I have that too, or I've dealt with that before too. Woo, he knows what I'm going through. He knows just what I need. Your God in heaven knows what it means to have a troubled spirit. He knows just what you need. The mercy and grace to flow. Number two, I would encourage you to pray for the strength and power to keep on keeping on, even with a troubled spirit. Don't let it derail you. Don't let it distra distract you. Don't let it detach you from God and his word and the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. Keep on keeping on. Ask for the strength. Gladly admit it that you cannot make it unless he upholds you and sustains you. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide your thoughts and direct your heart to the guaranteed triumph you have as an overcomer in Christ. Paul wrote what? No, he was troubled in his spirit, and yet he still wrote, thanks be unto God. That gives us this triumph in Christ. At the same time, I encourage you, have you paused and have you stopped and thank God for the open doors he's given you? Coworkers, family members, even open doors to be an encouragement to fellow believers. You know, some of us just needed to slow down enough to realize I I'm supposed to take care of fellow believers. I'm supposed to encourage them. Yes, it starts with my own home and my own household, but there's others that I can express and show care for and love for. Number three, pray for the mercy and grace we each need to handle these trials that trouble our spirit. This is your time of need, friend. He is your God of help. Cry out to him. Go to the endless well of grace and mercy, friend. Fill up your cup. Fill your heart and spirit. Fill your life this morning with what you need from the hand of God. Would you simply this morning be troubled, but always triumphant? You can be, as we plug into him.